and some of that cardboard too, some of that cardboard colors reflecting in that. You know, black shiny things, dark shiny things are reflective. Think of a, think of a car, a black car, it reflects everything around it. So, that's the difference between a reflection and a shadow. Gets a little tricky sometimes. That's why, as artists, we have to always be parsing out what is that a reflection? Is that a shadow? What am I seeing there exactly? Some of that green from the apple in the in the vase here. So isn't it interesting how it changes and develops and comes up, hopefully? Hopefully we're making improvements. And we're going to go around and do this to everything. The background, the foreground, the apples. That's a... Uh, that affects the shadows a good bit because that ambient light will feed into those shadows and you'll start to see what looks like two shadows. Sometimes you can take a piece of cardboard or something and put it along that edge and that takes away that ambient light. And sometimes you just have to do that a few times and then you can say, oh, I, I, I just want to paint the primary shadow. I don't want to get into that ambient secondary shadow, secondary ambient light source. Now that's not the highlight, but I am working up to the lighter part of the apple for sure. And, and you're just going to continue to push these relationships. Remember what I said, working out to the highlight and working to the darker darks. And sometimes it's good if you can to echo that shape, echo the way that comes forward. Resist the impulse to lay down every stroke in the same direction and rather see if you can find the direction that best describes the form that you're rendering. And as I say, if we're, I'm putting heavy paint down here because this is our champion, this is our star. And anything that's warm and rich and thick on this apple is going to be good for the painting. And sometimes you have to backtrack a little bit and reiterate your darks and lights and colors. That's okay. Especially if you're doing it with thick, confident paint. Oh, you'll notice I did switch to my Robert Simmons extra long filbert. This is the largest Robert Simmons. I think it's number eight. And this is where you're just creeping up to what is the maximum color you can put into this apple. And it is not at all about just randomly laying things down. You're working out of your mixtures and you're trying to get good paint layers with every stroke and you might go too far. Sometimes you might have to scrape things off. Now, I haven't put any highlights in. Always resist that urge until you know it's time. I want to make sure everything is feeling good. The foundation is feeling good. There's a perfect example of leaving myself somewhere to go and then coming back with a, with a much uh, 
more intense value and color. I actually like when you can see paint strokes that contain multiple colors of in the individual strokes. That, that can only happen if you lay things down and let them live and survive. If we uh, fall prey to that urge to blend, 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 then it's all just going to kind of modulate into one color. Let's take a look at our foreground for a second. I'm mixing kind of a yellow, yellow, ochre, and white, as well as some magenta and white. But I also want to feed some color into this so that we get that feeling of transition. And that we feel that difference between the the background and the foreground. See how it goes from lighter to darker and richer. Not that it has to feel like cardboard per se. Just want to feel it like a ground plane. And again, if, if there are different colors combining there, that's great. <clears throat> And you start taking special note as to where these, how these shadows and objects all meet up. This is why your, your viewpoint has to be constant. It has to remain the same. We can't paint a little bit over here and a little over here. In terms of when we're making our observations, it needs to be consistent. You could decide to pick up and move if you thought it was necessary, but once you uh, decide what it is you're going to paint, you want to carry that through. Okay, I think that's working. It's great to step back and look at your setup. And that's another reason to have your setup kind of high and level with your canvas as much as possible. Because then you can see both those things simultaneously. So going back up into that background, as we work out towards our lighter lights, it might not hurt to go a little brighter. Remember how extreme it seemed up there? when I put that lighter light down, and now it feels like it could actually go a good bit lighter. And I'm going much thicker with my paint. And in terms of composition, I'm realizing that this brings the eye towards that vase. So find a way to make your strokes where, where they're not going in one direction all the time. Giving kind of an organic shift, you know, kind of move your hand around. And that starts to give a feeling of spontaneity. So I'm really sensing light as I move around now. Where is it brighter? Where is that light falling? Where can I emphasize it? My eyes moving all over. And if I can see an area that's important and bright that I can bring up a little bit with a nice, confident, heavy mixture, that's going to help the painting. Well, let's start on the vase. 
Now one thing I'm seeing with the vase here is just a little bit too much intensity. So I'm just going to knock that back by blending it into what's underneath. Too much intensity in that reflection. And it seems like every time I look at it, I see more darks, dark, dark, darks. So, do both of those things. Okay, let's put some highlights on that base. So I'm going to start a mixture of white. It's very rare that a highlight would be white or that we would ever put pure white on our painting. There's a highlight up here where the light's catching that. And there are two here. So kind of a pinkish one on the handle here. Kind of a bluish one over here. So don't just put in your highlights all one color. Take the time to see what the difference is between them. Then we have the big ones over here. I'm grabbing a big hunk of white. And I may have to go into these, but it is nice when you can get these. I see a little bit of warm in there, so I'm going to mix a little bit of yellow ochre into this and just lay it down, see how it looks. Then there's one below it that's got a little more pink in it. So be real deliberate. Don't just lay down white. And it's not unusual to have to come in and nip these back a little bit. A lot of times there will be a dark right against them. That's what's going to make it feel very shiny, is if you find that dark that goes right adjacent to that bright highlight. reflections here. And the brightest highlight I see, you can actually see that it's the bulb. So I'm going to mix up a big glob of paint and put it right there. Now sometimes you have to come along and scrape those out. But I think that's okay. So there are highlights on the apples as well. Let's start with our back apple. And you only see part of that highlight. It's kind of about right there. And then this apple gets a warmer highlight. So the highlights are all different. You gotta look at them and say, what color is that? Exactly. I think there is a brighter one right here. I'm going to get another one of those globs of paint. Right about there. Sometimes you can sculpt that back a little bit. These are the things that really give the subject that feeling of being ceramic or an apple or what have you. So just back and forth, looking at different areas. No real defined process at this point. I like to call finishing a painting, bringing it home. And sometimes we can just go on and on and on. Sometimes we wish we had stopped, and sometimes we're glad that we kept 
laboring into that. One of the subjects that I haven't really covered is the idea of contrast. In other words, each of these aspects of painting, there's some degree of contrast. So with composition, you've got large elements, small elements, bright elements, more, less colorful, more muted elements. And generally you just want to have a contrast of these things, hard, soft, what have you. And then also in terms of space, you know, you want to have some empty space, some negative space, some real active space, some real colorful space. So that's the contrast that you can have in composition. And generally you want to avoid half, exactly half, like half negative, half uh, active space, for example. Uh, you want to have some kind of domination. So on this painting, we're definitely dominated with active space. We have some negative space in the foreground and in the background. Then uh, if we move on to drawing, we want some things that are really drawn out or rendered. And then we have some things that are just much less uh, rendered, much more casually rendered, so that our eye doesn't get stuck everywhere it goes. So you want to have a, a, some degree of balance there. Uh, and then if we move on to uh, value, you want some dark things, some light things. Uh, you don't want to have half and half. You want to have a mixture of those things. And same with color. You're going to have some intense color and some muted color. And we want to find something that is appealing not exactly half. You wouldn't want half pure color and half uh, muted color. And on and on. Same with paint uh, application. There's going to be thick paint applied and thin paint applied. As we've discussed, usually the thicker paint is in the lighter areas and the more intense areas, the more focal point areas. But you see my point there. You want to have a contrast. If it's all thin paint or if it's all thick paint, it's probably not going to be as appealing. So I like to get this idea of contrast out there, that you want to have a range. You don't want to have all hard edges or all soft edges. You want to use your hard edges and your bright colors and your intense value changes in your focal points. And this gets back to that idea of picture making. And when you've succeeded at doing that, you're going to be leading the eye around when somebody looks at your picture. It's not just a depiction of what is in front of you, <clears throat> but you've made a picture that shows you and shows the viewer, you know, the way that you conceive this creative endeavor. So that's what I'm doing now. Just going around and making sure that, that the picture works for me and hopefully for the viewer. And I, I am using a little smaller brush. This is the uh, Robert Simmons number four but I am still making confident, strong mixtures. Just doing this for a little while. And then at some point, we say, it's done. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've really enjoyed making it, and we're gonna make some more of them about different subjects like landscape, portraiture, figure drawing. So keep in touch. You can find me on the web, richardchristiannelson.com, and I look forward to hearing from you about your journey as an artist. I always say, painting is a process. So the more we can go through these steps, from conception to calling it done, using each of these different steps that we talked about. Our work is going to get better. We're going to be making fewer mistakes, and then we're going to grow as artists. And that's the mission for all of us. Before we go, I wanted to take a second to show you our gallery, Skyuka Fine Art, here in Tryon, North Carolina. My wife, Kim, and I opened this gallery in December of 2010. And we represent local, regional, and even some national artists now. It's been a lot of fun having the gallery. I hope you ever get to our part of the world in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. You'll come by and visit us. And check us out on the web, skyukafineart.com, and keep painting.